start to believe Listen to your heart Tell me that you understand Cause you are the one for me You just believe 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 Yes, people, welcome back to another stream. I know we only spoke last night about the events over the weekend, but it was only right that we got a few guests on. I did promise you guys, uh, after we went full-time on this channel, that we would start to get some great guests on, and I think we've started off with an absolute banger. Two fantastic guests joining myself and Joe today. As always, you'll know Big Steve. Welcome, Big Steve, to the channel. Uh, it might be your first time on here. You've been all around the world recently. How are you, my friend? Very well, thank you. Even better after yesterday, so yeah. Ready to go? Ready to go, man. Ready to go. And making his debut as well. Long overdue on the channel, Mr. Tone, MCFC Tone. Plenty of you will know him from Twitter. Welcome. How are you, my friend? I'm very well, thank you. Yeah, all good. Like Steve, buzzing after yesterday. Bring it on. Bring it on. Bring it on. Six to go, I believe. Lots to look forward to. We're going to chat a bit about the events over the weekend. City obviously did their job against Luton. And then we had what people are, are donning as bottle jobs Sunday yesterday. So we can discuss if they're actual bottle jobs uh, and where the league is lying and how we feel about the whole thing. But before we do, house rules, make sure you've hit that big thumbs up button. Subscribe to the channel if you're new and check out everybody's links in the description at Big Steve MCFC. Check out his YouTube channel, always active over there. And MCFC Tone, his link to Twitter will be in the description as well. Right, boys, let's get started. Um I don't know, did you guys watch the the overlap episode with Eric Dyer? Um, with, well, obviously, Gary Neville went out to Munich and he spoke to Eric Dyer about his time and so on and so forth. And one thing they spoke quite in depth about was the pressure you can apply to other teams by playing first on a weekend. Now, for us, it was just a case of doing our job, beating Luton. You would like to think it's straightforward. I know title races can throw spanners in the works. We put the pressure on. We did what we had to do. We went top of the league. We were all expecting both Liverpool and Arsenal to do their jobs respectively, and it didn't happen. I did not expect, Steve, that come Monday morning, Manchester City would be top of the league and have it in our hands. I really didn't. No, I don't think anyone did realistically. Um, but I've been saying on a few shows last few weeks that, you know, it's not necessarily the big games what win and lose the title for you. It's more the, the ones where your team go into it probably feeling a little bit you know, oh yeah, we'll beat these today and we'll just keep on moving. And then all of a sudden they find themselves one nil down, two nil down, panic stations, the fans are are up in arms about it and that. And, and that's what happened yesterday, you know what I mean? To to see Liverpool lose the other night to Atalanta, you're thinking, okay, they're gonna they're gonna have a bit of reaction. Jurgen's not gonna like that, it's gonna they're gonna put it right against Palace. Couldn't do it, missing a lot of chances. Um, Palace played really, really well. I don't think the the, the Palace and Villa are getting enough credit um, off the media today. I think yeah, feel like yeah. they did really well. And then Arsenal, you know, they, they had the opportunity with Liverpool losing. Right, OK, Liverpool's lost. It's in your hands. Go make a statement today. Put yourself a little bit of light between you and the other teams and, and kick on. And the pressure got to them, you know. And, and that, in my opinion, was always about mentality for Arsenal. I, I do believe Liverpool have that mentality and they're capable of, of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with us. I don't believe Arsenal are. I just feel like they've always got one or two of these little results in, in, in the locker and, and they've opened the door now. Both teams have opened the door wide enough and Manchester City have stepped inside and uh, it's a whole different ball game now with, with, us, with us at the top of the league and six games to go. So we just got to do our job. We've all been there. We've supported this club long enough. We know what we're about now. And um, we've just got to keep going, 
one game at a time, step by step, and get this league title over the line. My, my surprise for being top of the league and kind of having it in our hands comes from the fact that I, I think, Tone, it's fair to say we've not been ourselves this season. We are not the team that won the treble. We are not probably the team that won any of the three in a row. We have definitely been lacking in certain areas of the pitch, wh whether it's down to you know not replacing certain players, whether it's down to hunger, wh whatever way you want. But as Steve put it, and I, I think it's perfect, and I saw, Steve, you said it on, on Turkish's stream as well uh, about an hour ago, that if you leave the door even slightly open for Manchester City, we're going to take the opportunity. I mean, Tom, did you expect that opportunity to come this weekend? No, no, I didn't. I, I thought uh, I thought one of them would drop points. More, I actually thought Liverpool were more likely to drop points than Arsenal yesterday, just because of the way Liverpool had lost in the week. But then part of me thought they'll react and win three or four put Palace in the place and say, yeah, that was just a one-off. But yesterday showed that it's not a one-off and they're, they're looking tired. They, more mentally, I think they look tired. And the same with Arsenal as well. I thought they looked mentally drained. Obviously, you know, you can only see what you can see. We don't know that. But the way they played, they just looked mentally drained, both teams. But I didn't expect, certainly not the results yesterday. If someone would have said before, oh, they both lose you'd be like what what i think the odds were someone said they put a couple of quid on 170 to one or something which tells you yeah it's just just a crazy afternoon of football but, but yeah I, I thought one may slip up and i thought that would be liverpool but i, I wasn't confident in it to be honest I want to focus in a bit on Arsenal, Joe, because I felt with Liverpool dropping points, this was Arsenal's cue. This was Arsenal's cue to go and put a bit of daylight between um, themselves and Liverpool. My my total opinion, my honest opinion for a long time was it won't be a three-horse race. I genuinely didn't feel it would be a three-horse race right to the end. I felt one team would slip up uh, and not be able to hack the pace. Which one of those teams that would be? I, I wasn't totally sure, but I thought a three-horse race wasn't um, going to be the case. And then... Liverpool went and dropped points. I was like, right, okay. You know, Liverpool have been a bit of an enigma this season, probably overachieved based on, you know, the signings they've made, the, the refreshing of the team, Klopp and Einstein's leaving in January. I really thought it was Arsenal's opportunity because Arsenal have been, what people many agree, playing the best football, you know, solid defence, scoring plenty of goals, but they didn't stand up. It seems to be in Arsenal's DNA, and I'm not saying for one second that everything's done, but it seems to be in Arsenal's DNA, Joe, that when the pressure's on, they just can't handle it, and, and, and something like this comes along. This was a game, it's another one of those games for me that Arsenal overlooked. They're pinpointing fixtures in the season saying, we win these games, we'll win the league. This was a game that you had to win? Well, they were under the most pressure this weekend for me because we already did our job on Saturday, so we were top of the league. And then you add to the fact that whatever way the Liverpool result would go, they knew that they simply had to win because we won, but... Of course, you're looking at both sides of the Liverpool game. Liverpool lost that game, so Arsenal got a bit giddy. I thought they got ahead of themselves thinking they can put daylight between the rest of them. Liverpool dropped points. It was their time. And if you flip it the other way, if Liverpool win, then again, there's loads of pressure because their two rivals have won. Now it's up to them to try and win the game and catch up to them. So they had the most pressure on them this weekend. And again, it's another one of these things where... I don't know whether they're too emotional, whether, like Tone said, whether they're tired. I don't know what it is, but they looked hopeless. I thought they were really good in the first half, and I thought it was just a matter of time before they'd eventually score. They missed a good load of chances in that first half. But that second half was all Villa. Like, they got pretty dominated in that second half. Like, Villa hit the post a couple of times as well. It could have been worse than 2-0. Like, I don't know what happened. And, you know, you add to the fact that they've got a, you know, a stalemate against Bayern Munich. They have to go to Germany and get a win if they want to progress in the Champions League. You know, they can't afford to pick and choose games. They can't afford to look forward to your Tottenham's away and, and all these sorts of games. They've got to take it one game at a time. That's why we do so well. Because whenever Pep gets asked about a game that's a few, you know, a few games away, you know, big Champions League games that's a couple of league games away, he never answers questions. He always goes, we've got these next. Let's focus on these. That's the mentality that we have. And for some reason, it feels like Arsenal don't have that. They always seem to focus on, you know, some of the bigger games down the line and they end up slipping up. They do. I mean, I, I've enjoyed watching um, the Arsenal fans analyse their situation. And I get, I get a real feeling that 
when when they do slip up or something goes against them like yesterday you really see their true colors there's an awful lot of them are showing that they didn't really believe when they said they believed and they're starting to go in on their own players a lot i mean one that we know very well steve is gabriel jesus i'm seeing him get a, a huge huge amount of stick and i'm pretty sure you were the same as me on the big six when they signed him you said you're not getting the player you think you're getting. I think they thought that they were getting an absolute bagsman who's, I mean, I think his top scoring season for City was 14. So he, he was he never really had a prolific season. He scored now 14 in two seasons for Arsenal. Um, they're going in on Saka, <coughs> the untouchable Bakayo Saka. They're going in on Declan Rice. And the big thing for me yesterday was I compare our run-ins of previous years, Steve, and you'll know this from going to games that, even when we play games that we might drop points in the last sort of 10 games or we're not playing particularly well, we'd still always be there right to the end. We would never really give up belief. We'd always be in the stadium. We'd always be trying our best to keep the players going. I watched the game on TV yesterday, and when they went 1-0 down, the Emirates started to empty. The Emirates started to empty. And I'm starting to think was all this belief and all this telling us how great you are and how magnificent you are, was it all just hot smoke? It's all bollocks. It's all bollocks. Simple as that. It's literally... Bullshit. It's if you're a player in the Arsenal team and you've done what you've done this season, they've had a fantastic season. You get beat off uh, Villa, you fall to your knees at the final whistle, disappointed. When you get up off your knees and look around and there's no fucker in the stadium, that's when you realise, hold on a minute, these fans don't even believe in us. They don't even believe we can do it. You you know, you give Liverpool and City credit when we're in these title runnings. If we've got a knock on the way, we stay behind, we clap the team. You know, I remember going to West Ham. Drawing 2-2, we were two down at half-time, we never panicked, we got the result. Then we went to Villa at home. Good job we all did fuck off at 2-0 when Aston Villa were up, won it. And, when, you know, as we'd have missed one of the best moments mm -hmm. in our life. But the mentality is fragile from them. They know it is. You know you, and, 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 and I know what the shit we've had off Arsenal fans all season about what we're going to do, you're this, you're that, all that nonsense. But at the end of the day now... You can't go running with a tail between your legs and start saying they get Arteta out, Gabriel Jesus' is shit, Zinchenko shit. Because the other week, they were the best players since sliced bread. Declan Rice was the best midfielder in Europe. Gabriel was the best centre-back in the world. Ray was the best keeper in the world. He just got slapped off, uh, off uh, Aston Villa at home. And here's another thing. On the big six, I called it out. You, you had the chance to come to the Etihad Stadium prove you were worthy champions, go and beat Man City in their own backyard. And we wasn't playing well, by the way. We were there for the taking. Put a marker down and put some distance between. You didn't. You shit yourself. Two banks of five. You got a point. Tried to spin it into this great defensive masterclass. Well, let me tell you this. Aston Villa yesterday, they came to the, uh, the Emirates Stadium, a team that's got the best defence and the best uh, goals scored in the league. Did Aston Villa shit themselves? No. They went toe to fucking toe and blew mm -hmm. them out the water. So at the end of the day, that just shows you the mentality in the club. Unai Emery has instilled a mentality in Aston Villa where it's, look, we're going to fucking go for it and we're going to see where we can go. And Mikel Arteta has installed this mentality where it's great when everything's going well, he takes all the applause, but when the fucking shit hits the fan at the end of the season and you've got to grow a pair of bollocks, not one of them players who he relies on has got a pair. Simple as that. They can't take any constructive criticism. I was fully on board with you regarding their performance at the Eddie Head. I was like, if you're going to lay down a marker and prove you are that team, you know what I mean? Bark like a big dog, behave like a big dog. Dude, I've got a voice note on my phone of one of their invincibles saying to me, yeah, you was right on the big six show. Arsenal, player. yeah, a player, did not show the mentality, Steve, but only football people will get that. Some of the people in the chat won't understand that. That is off one of their players. I've got it there. In, in, in the in the thing and and a lot of Arsenal fans messaged me and said the same we felt like Man City were there for the taking we didn't think Arsenal were going to set up like that we were coming to the Etihad to have a toe to toe and uh, look if they'd have beat City they'd have put light and goal difference between them they could have lost to Villa yesterday and they'd have still been ahead of us you know what I mean this is the difference we'd have been out of it but they, they went away happy as a pig in shit it's all in our hands it isn't anymore, lads. I'm sorry, but it isn't. Well, that that was the, that game was the first sign of leaving the door open for City, wasn't it? You should have come to the Etihad and killed Manchester City while you had the chance. That was the opportunity for Arsenal to come and, as I say, bark like a big Dude, dog. The season Leicester won the league, yeah? yeah? They went to every fucking ground in that Premier League and put it on everyone. Yeah, yeah. They didn't mm -hmm. hide from nobody, no reputation. They went and put it on everyone, and they beat everyone, and they won the league. 
That is what you've got to do if you're going to win it. Last year, we were told, wait until you get to the Emirates. We're going to do this, this and this. We went marching from the boozer outside the Emirates all the way to the ground like an army and said, we're fucking here now. Let's have it. And we had it and we've done them. They come to our place, hid like mice in a fucking corner, got a point and tried to tell us it was a, it was the best point that's ever been seen in Premier League history. And now they're crying. They want the manager out. They want the defenders out. They want Zinchenko out. And yeah, happy fucking days. Yeah, and they were, I mean, they, they were parading it like a trophy that they hadn't lost to City all season. And they thought this was an entitlement to go and win the Premier League. Well, you've not lost to City all season, but you're now behind City in the league. So there's a certain mentality required to, to go and win a Premier League. And I mean, Tone, hmm. I, I'm not saying they can't win it, but I just don't see it with them. I just don't see the, the mentality with Arsenal. I think, like, obviously it's in our hands now. It's up to us to go and win it. But I just see too many, it's too fragile. Yeah, it was certainly, yeah, with Arsenal. The, the day I thought they wouldn't win the Premier League was, and I, I've not been on board with them pretty much all season, but due to the mentality reason and the leaders in that team, the real experienced trophy winners in that team to see them over the line. But the game was the one at the Etihad, and I think I was on another show, maybe LB possibly, and I said on there that... It, it, I personally thought that draw showed they're not ready. They don't want it. They don't want the title. And they come off, oh, my Lord, Arteta was over with the crowd. Nil, nil, bloody marvellous. We had key players missing and lost one in the game. Rico had come on. We were shuffling things around. We, you know, we for City, we weren't playing particularly great. We were a bit sluggish. That was the time. Now, if you tell me this, an on fire Liverpool team that we've had a few years ago would have would have beat us. I think Pep made a comment. Oh no, that was Champ League. Sorry, but the on fire Liverpool team when they had Firmino, Salah, and all that lot would have put two or three past us and made the statement because they were ready to win the league that year. Arsenal are not ready. They sat there. They didn't attack. They I barely remember a shot. So. I completely agree with everything Steve said about the mentality. You can see it, the crowd walking out. You know, Arteta acts like a bloody idiot on the sideline throughout games all the time. Odegaard doing fancy flicks, you know, always better than De Bruyne. It's like Saka, he, he, I'm still yet to see him play well in a big game. Declan Rice is a good player. He's been compared to Rodri. You know, Saliba, he's better than Diaz and Stones. We've heard it all. When these guys start winning serious titles, once they've done the domestic quad, the treble, five in six years, all this other stuff that we've broken, then, then we'll listen. Then we're all for it. And we'll say, Arsenal, fair play, brilliant. But until then, they're bottle jobs and they know it. Like Steve said, they absolute deep down, they know it. And now they're all on their channels today and on their accounts saying, we bloody bottle jobs get Arteta out four days ago they were saying they were going to win the league mm -hmm. now it's over today it's fragile FC man joke. fragile FC it is Steve with yeah handle with care yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is <laughs> it is they're one of those um one of those packages you get in the airport wrapped in bubble wrap, you know, where you have to That's really, it, yeah. really... <laughs> I'm going with Kenny, I tell you, all of them. But it, it just does it, it, it does just show the mentality. I mean, you, you've been on the big six a couple of times for me recently, Steve, and just by coincidence, it's fallen at times where we've dropped points and you've had to take the heat for me. Um but me and you've been the same, Steve, that even when it very much wasn't in our hands, City weren't playing great. Neither of us ever said once we're out. The league's done. No. You know, we're, we're not going to win this. We we always, always, always as a fan base, and it's something I love about this fan base, is that even when the chips are down, even when we're not playing well, we're conceding goals, we're not of the same standard maybe that we were last season. We still always said, you know what, we're still in this. If you give us a chance, give us a chance. Don't give us a chance. Don't slip up. Um, we believe we can go and capitalise. You compare that with both Arsenal and Liverpool, and I expect it better from Liverpool in this situation as they have the mentality monster Jurgen Klopp. They have that bit more experience uh, in terms of title races with us. But I've been disappointed with both of them, the way, Steve, they've both just thrown in the towel with six games to go. We have to go to Brighton now uh, on, on a yeah. Thursday night, I think it is. We have to go to Nottingham Forest. We have an FA Cup semi-final. We have Champions League still to contend with. We have to go to Tottenham. Nothing's done for me. Still nothing's no. done for me. But for the rest of world football, four in a row is complete. 
we just I think that we're very very fortunate that we are uh, a good fan base we all talk every channels we all link with each other go on different channels and that so we all seem to be on the same page and I feel like if there was someone in the in the, in the uh, YouTube space who was a city uh you know fucking okay. defeatist and they were going down all the time and didn't like this and didn't like that. I feel like he'd get called out so and you know everyone's entitled to their opinion but we we try and keep calm because the reactionary things yeah it's good for views and yeah people you know you might get earn a few quid out of it but when you've got to go to the match every week like us and you've got to stand there with your supporters and that people don't like that you know what I mean some people will say to me oh you, 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 you're too positive and I'm like how can you be too positive you know it's a fucking <laughs> weird thing to say what do you want me to be negative you know, and, and, and spoil everything but I feel like we've been here before I feel like this is territory we've been in with Liverpool toe to toe you know they asked me on the overlap the other week how did it make me feel in a title running and I said it makes me ill now any match going fan or people that go week in week out who, who talk about football every day like us will know what that feels like all the knobheads in the chat were like, this guy thinks he plays centre-back for City. So it made me laugh, you know what I mean? Because they clearly never experienced it. Well, you know the skate, you know what it's like. And I just feel like we've been here before, we're calm. And I feel like Pep Guardiola and that City team are very lucky to have fans and a fan base like us, where we don't jump on the back after one bad result. We don't get on a young player's case because he's had a, a bit of a stinker. We're there, we're level-headed, we know and trust the players. And I feel like we've got it right at our end. And, and, and the people have ripped us all season. You're not the same team. You've lost Gundogan. You've lost Mares. You, you're not going to win the treble. You're not going to do this. And we've just sat back patiently. We've took it all on board. We're not the ones having meltdowns now. We're the ones sat in a nice position with six games to go to win the fourth title in a row. So we know what we've got to do. We've just got to keep positive and everybody's got to keep focused and just, like we said, old cliche, one game at a time. Yeah, I think people don't un understand enough um, the feeling of of going to the games a lot. I mean, I was fortunate enough during the treble season to go to most of the games. You know, I was there home and away every week. And I think you were right what you said on the overlap, but how it makes you feel sick. And like I said, I said on all the shows I did after we completed the treble, I was like, I feel like I've won the treble just because I was there. You know, I was going uh, home and away around Europe. You feel really involved, really ingrained. So when you see fans leaving stadiums like they were yesterday, I'm like, what good is that doing for your team? No, Nothing is finished. What, no. what, what good is are, are you doing for your club by leaving on on the 85th, 90th minute when you know you still got six games to go? It's not benefiting anyone. Um, oh, my Wi-Fi gone. Still here. Well, there. Yeah, he's still, uh, here, still here. Still here. Sorry, sorry. I don't know what's happened there. My PC is having a meltdown. But I mean, I don't know what you think about it, Joe. Uh, do you want to take over there when I sort this out? I mean, yeah, it, I mean, the amount of red seats was absolutely shocking. It's not the first time we've seen it, though, is it? Like, there's been screenshots before. Was it Brighton at home at the end of last season where they'd pretty much almost thrown it away? Where just everyone was walking down the street. There was pictures of them all, all the fans just walking down the road. They were gone. They were they were finished. That was them. They, like that was their season. They they thought it was all over, even though yes, it technically was over because they lost to Forest after that. And handed us the league title, but you know where, where's the mentality of it's not over till it's over. Like you can expect, you can maybe expect not to win it. Like there's a difference between expecting not to win it and saying, "Oh, we're not going to win it," and giving up. And that's kind of where Arsenal are. Where again, four days ago they were the best team in the world. They were going to do the double Champions League, Premier League. They were going to win everything. And now four days later, they've had one loss. One loss. I think that's their first loss this calendar year and the season's over. I, d I don't get it. Why are you walking out? There's still stuff to play for. Yeah, no, Absolutely. it's right. And, and like, I do I do actually believe that um, Arsenal are not a million miles away from having a title winning team. I do feel like no. that they're thereabouts. They have improved. But it's just the way that they sort of was like, you're finished. We're going to win this league now like last year didn't happen yeah. and then it's like we're going to win the Champions League as well like like Man City's not been trying that for years getting in all these semis and finals and finals and that, like it's dead easy um, but I don't know I just I find their fan base very very draining now there's one or two good lads in, in, in who I speak to who are 
quite calm and level headed. And I do get that the old AFTV and that sort of bandwagon can get a bit mad. And we shouldn't all judge the Arsenal guys like that. But, you know, when you're putting up with it every day, you're the same. You guys are probably the same. You're waking up every morning, 115, and fucking this and all that bullshit. And it just bores the fucking tits out of you. So when you get a nice opportunity like this to be a bit smug, Apparently, we're the only team in the world that can win trebles. You're not allowed to celebrate it because you're arrogant. Uh, you can win <laughs> you know, three in a row. You're not allowed to talk about that as well because that's arrogant. But um, someone can win a Carabao Cup and it's rammed down your fucking neck all the time. So, uh, it's, yeah. yeah it, it's a cheek as well to be called arrogant by the fans that celebrate, uh, sing, we're going to win the league in February. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's, it, Arsenal was singing it at, I can't remember, Brentford or somewhere. It, clearly hear it okay it might be a bit ironic a bit of a laugh but they still bloody believe it well they believed it until four days ago lose one game everyone out like we've said but Arsenal fans mentality is the exact same as the players and everyone else there they're not winners they don't believe it they can come on Twitter and all the shows and Sky Sports and interviews saying oh oh we're better we're ready we've got we are here now prove it prove it and they could still win the league from here that's yeah. the difference is we're not saying they cannot win the league. We might say we don't think they will. And no City fan is out today that I've seen anyway saying, oh, we've won it. It's done. No. We're, we're the best. We're no, we've we've said, we've, everyone's saying we, yeah. we, 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 we've been given a great opportunity. Yeah. Let's go and take it. We are humble. Yeah. We, we're, not, we're not shouting it from the rooftops and we just want to get it done. But like you say, it's... Uh, I think there's going to be more twists and turns. There's going to be games where probably yeah. City might drop the other point, but I don't believe Arsenal and Liverpool can go and win every game now. I don't believe that. Agree with you, yeah. Especially, I think if City win their next four, all difficult, Forest away will be tough. I think we've got Fulham away. Oh, bloody hell. I right. even saw the list. Brighton, Brighton yeah. away. Yeah, Brighton away and Wolves at home, I think is yeah. one of that four. If they win that four, I think we'll win the league. I, I think that four is key because Arsenal and Liverpool got tough games and I think they will drop points in those games. Mm. And we could, could walk into Tottenham possibly as champions. Uh, to be honest, I bloody hope so because I do not want to be going to Tottenham with it riding on that game. You know, you have to win to stay in. Bloody hell. One right. of the maddest games at this season, like, you know, Tottenham away, cup. Cool. 9,000 fans Friday night, mm. fucking mental, and we go and win. And then there's been times where we've turned up there with an absolute unbelievable team, and you think, yeah, we're going to do it, and we just can't get over the line. But uh, I fancy us now. I do, I do. I'm confident and fancy us. I think mm. everything's ticking right. But like you say, we've got a massive one on Wednesday night, Real Madrid, which is uh, is, is, is massive. It's massive. Yeah. After what we did in the Bernabeu last week, we've got to go and put it right here again. The fans, us, 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 us going to the game and... and 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 that you've got we've got to be there. We've got to leave it all in the in in the stadium on Wednesday night. Yeah, well, we, we may as well. Uh, I'll do these super chats and then we'll we'll talk a bit about Real Madrid. I want to touch a bit on Liverpool as well and Jurgen Klopp. A lot of talk about him. Uh, guys, make sure you've all hit the like button. Uh, the likes massively help. Myself and Joe gone full time on this channel, so all of your support massively helps. Um, so yeah, hit the like button, subscribe if you're new. Got Josh here saying if we win every game, it's a quintuple, not a treble. Um, oh, that's including the Super Cup and the, the Club World Cup. So, yeah, we, we could do five trophies this season. Um, double treble for, for you guys. Is is it a reality? Is it becoming an increasing reality? Um, I'm trying to ignore those those words myself. I, I'll jump. Um, I, you no, know, same as you, Hugh, to be honest. I, I, I don't think about it, I, you know. I don't want to think about it because that then puts the expectation and a bit of stress on for every bloody game. And I know it's there. And every game is blues, as we all know, every single game we go into now, you know, you're thinking, shit, we've got to win. This is in October, November now, where if you drop, it's fine. We've still got 30 games to go. It's win or bust now in ev pretty much every single game, certainly for the next month or so. So, no, I'm not thinking about it, but it is certainly possible. But that's, I don't want to say any more because I'll jinx it. I, I don't really want to indulge <laughs> double treble conversation until no. we have a league and an FA Cup one and we're in the Champions League final. Because <laughs> how many times have we seen Liverpool and, and even Arsenal recently way too early begin the quadruple talks and the treble talks and 
Uh, and they make these things sound like they're they're easier to achieve than they realistically are. So I mean, and they're you, not. Steve, this is the thing. They're not. It's so unique that treble. Like it, people just reel it off as if it's like, oh yeah, you're gonna do the treble. You know, like it's just fucking normal. It's not normal that you know what I mean. But we're just there, like you say, like Pep says, we will be there. Let's just keep going. We will be there. We will be there. Uh, Miro says Vardial looking solid. I'm really impressed with Vardial the last couple of weeks. I think he's really, really starting to turn into the player that uh, we were all very excited to see. And people, people in, in the footballing world were so quick to to give out and slander Josco Vardial this season and completely ignore the facts. They they solely focus on the price tag that he came in for. And I get I get it. People do that work away, but it's not for me. There's a lot more context to it. The kid's 21. Do you know what I mean? He, he makes me feel old. He's 21 and he's been told to now play as a left back where he's never really played consistently in his life in an attacking role uh, for Manchester City, which is an extremely hard thing to just come in and do off the cuff. And, you know, Ake's been out for large parts of the season, so there's been slightly more responsibility in Vardial. But hey, I tell you what, lads, a goal on the Bernabeu is um, something he'll never, ever forget. And what a hit. Steve, you're in the away end as well, right in front of us, smacked into the, into the side netting. It was just... The, the kid's got it, man. The kid's got it. He's going to be... I think he, next season, we're going to see even 10, 20, 30% more from Vardial because uh, he's a serious, serious player. And I'm gassed for him. I'm gassed for him. He seems like a great guy as well. So, yeah, big up Vardial. Uh, Miro again. QPC is like Arsenal fans. Meltdown. <laughs> yeah, I got some new gear for my PC, so um, it's, it's kind of kind of getting used to it but listen big up all the super chats make sure you hit the like button and subscribe if you're new check out the lads tone mcfc tone on twitter big steve mcfc on uh youtube get him up in the subscribers right real madrid like i said we were there during the week steve um we got a 3-3 draw i think before the game we all agreed that um or as a fan base that if we got a draw at the burnabout you bite the hand off it uh to bring it back to the Etihad and just have a 90 minute shootout um, how do you feel going into Wednesday night? And did you see anything from Real Madrid in the Bernabeu that makes you think when they come to the Etihad this time, they will be much more dangerous and threatening than they were last time? I think it's Real Madrid, isn't it? So, you, you, you know, you've got to show them respect. They've earned it. That You know, you're not playing some lower league Europa, te Europa team. It's, it's, it's Real Madrid. We went there the other night. Um, Ortega in net, no Kyle Walker. Um, Kevin De Bruyne's out before kickoff with an illness. You're thinking, hold on a minute, it's just been made a lot harder. Uh, and we, we 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 took the game to them, and um, we could have come away with a three-two. We didn't three-three, but we were taking it all day. We were happy, and they uh, they the last thing they want is to come to the Etihad after what happened last year with no lead. So I think it's in our hands. I do think that the crowd is going to be important. I know the 1894 have organised a coach greeting. Around 6:30 at the main entrance, I think the uh, there's a load of tifos planned in the ground, and I just feel like every Man City fan that's going to the stadium on Wednesday night has got to put a shift in. You know what I mean? Uh, if you see anyone with an iPad filming the game, <laughs> squat him with it. Um, but no, don't squat him with it because I don't want to get banned. But what I'm saying is, we don't. Big Steve told me to squat him with the iPad. Yeah, big what Man City at Wednesday in a big game, man. Just let's get behind the boys. Let's get everyone mm. going. Because last time it definitely helped. You know, the, the newspaper in Madrid, Marsa, they said Real Madrid fell into a trap. We didn't expect it. And uh, I just feel like we've got to be on it from the from the first whistle. But with all the players coming back, I feel like we can do a job, mate. I'm really confident. Vinicius Jr. said after the game last season that the Eddie had um, that night was the most intense atmosphere he's ever played at. And I back it. I believe it. And I was so taken back by it that night in the South Stand because do you remember the debacle leading up to it, Steve, with tickets and that that game? You know what I mean? Tickets fall into the wrong hand. The club made yeah. a bollock. For the fans to turn up that night like they did with the big, um, what did it say again? The the big banner. They've used it since then again. You know the one I'm on about? Oh, you everywhere. Did they use oh, that everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely class. It was unbelievable. I think the fans need to do that again um, on Wednesday night. But Tone, like Steve said, a lot of players come back. There's increasing talk about whether Kyle Walker should start the game. I did think, I did, and to give Real Madrid credit, they were really threatening in the wide areas. Both Rodrigo and Vinicius on Wednesday night, really dangerous, cutting us open, um, you know, simple balls through our defence, and they were on the end of them. That's essentially how they got their goals. Would you throw Kyle Walker back into right fullback? You know, he is known to be a bit of a specialist for these kind of tasks. Uh, well, he's not going to be fully fit, 
so it's a big, big, big risk to throw him in in this game. And I understand he plays well against, you know, the top, top players, Vinicius and Mbappe when we play Paris. So if he's fully fit, yeah, he plays in this game. Big question marks. I know he's been training and he's had his own programme and all this sort of stuff. So, and I know he's put out that he wants to play and he's ready and all this sort of thing. But Pep did mention yesterday about, uh, you know, he'll make the decision because he doesn't want to lose Kyle for longer. So that clearly he's not fully fit. To answer your question, if he is not fully fit, I probably wouldn't play him. I'd probably maybe go with a Kanji there. If he's approaching full, then fine. But I just think it's a massive, massive risk to take in this game. Maybe an hour, but yeah, sorry, I'm hovering between the two because he is very, very key for this type of game. But I just don't think you can risk a slight... Because Kyle Walker hasn't had his best season either, to be honest. And I think even that and if he's slightly not fit enough is a big is too much of a risk in my opinion for 90 minutes against Real Madrid I think you you've got to go the fully fit ready team in in my view it's difficult though because there's, there's no doubt that Vinicius is their biggest threat he is the, mm. the if you if you can go a long way to nullify, nullifying Vinicius junior you go a long way to win him the game or at least stop them scoring goals and walker has such a great track record at doing so i mean yeah, you, you looked at Bellingham uh, during the week. I, I didn't think he was he was all that amazing. And um, the Madrid fans aren't too impressed with Bellingham at the minute. I thought Rodrigo was good, but Vinicius is the main outlet. Joe, would you would would you go with Kyle Walker? I do agree with Tone. I don't think Walker's had his best season, but there's just he's just as a specialist for for these nights. And this might be like one of the last times that he's needed as a specialist this season. Of course, he'd be useful in other games. He is the club captain, but. Again, like Tom said, he's not had his greatest season. There's been a lot of, you know, off the field issues. There's been some on the field issues sometimes with the role that he's playing. He's been asked, especially the start of the season, to play as like a high flying fullback and put crosses into the box, which he's just not very good at. So it's not been the greatest of seasons. And there is that risk. My mind goes back to not the Madrid games last year, but the, the season before that, where he got, what, an hour in the Bernabeu before he got injured and had to be taken off? And that mm. basically threw our game plan out the window. We had someone else come on. Uh, if you remember the first leg, we're playing Fernandinho at right back. He got rinsed because he was just old and just shouldn't have really been playing there. Like, it's a risk not to play him because, like you said, their most dangerous player plays in the position that he'd be marking. But it's also a very big risk to play him because he hasn't played football since the international break. He's probably not going to be 100% fit. Um, and he's not been... You, you don't know which Kyle Walker is going to turn up. I I have more confidence in him having a better game if John Stones is in the team because that means Kyle Walker is going to be asked to stay back, which suits him a bit more. So he's probably going to be a bit better. And, and I, I would back him, but again, it's the whole fitness thing. Do you risk him? Because if he if he's injured, if he gets injured after this game, there's you know there's there's, there's the slight possibility that that's his season. If he gets injured, that could be his season. I would risk him. I think we did all right the other night in the Bernabeu without him. I feel like Akanji, for me, has been one of the unsung heroes of this season. I feel like he's improved. He can play anywhere. He's powerful. He's strong. And, yeah, he did get caught for a bit of pace. But I think at home, the trick is not to... We don't need to force it like we did at the Bernabeu. We can stay a little bit relaxed, but keep Kyle on the bench. If if if, if, if first half... You know, you know, we are getting a few scares down there, then we've got the option of doing it. But if we're doing all right, why change it? And I feel like Real Madrid, um, you know, Venetius comes inside anyway. Kyle Walker's vulnerable to that, you know, letting him come inside anyway. So, but I don't know. I don't think, I don't think we need him like that. I think we, I think that Real Madrid um, hoodoo where we were all scared of Venetius Jr. and we thought we've got to do that. I think we've broken that now. I think that we've shown the last few games against Real Madrid that they're probably more scared of us than we are of them. So I feel like they're probably thinking, how do we get through this City team? And I think I don't think anyone wants to play against a Kanja. I think Vinicius will get a run on Kyle and they can have a bit of a, a sprint off. But I feel with a Kanji, he was first to the ball, he was up their ass, and he was fucking forcing into the back of him, knocking him about a little bit. I don't think Real Madrid want, want that kind of physical presence there. So... I'd play a Kanji me, a Kanji Stones, 
Diaz and a key Guardiola, Guardiola left back as well. Hundred percent. Yeah, agree. Yeah. I, I agree. I agree. I, I think Akanji, as you say, is one of the un- unsung heroes this season, and one of the unsung heroes in general since he signed uh, the, the treble winning season as well. Like he's he's so so reliable, so versatile, and adds so much in, in in both ends of the pitch. But I mean, while we're focusing on the threats that Real Madrid can pose, and 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 while you know what what solutions we can come with come up with to combat it, we have serious threats of our own. Serious serious threats of our own starting in, in that area of the pitch. They're going to be wary of Josco Vardial getting forward on, on Wednesday night. They're going to be worried about that. But even moving slightly forward up the pitch, uh, you would think Kevin De Bruyne will come back into his natural role. I don't know what that means for Phil Foden, but I do want to talk about Phil Foden because I don't think he's getting anywhere near enough um, of the praise and respect he deserves. Would you play, would you play De Bruyne? This is the this would is you, would you start, would you start Foden in there because of what he did there or like you say or do you kick do you, do you think De Bruyne's got the legs to do it now around there I mean it's all right against Luton he looked okay but Real Madrid it's a different kettle of fish do you think Pep knows that no would he have started in the burnabout for the illness do we know that or I don't know I think feel like we need Kevin De Bruyne but I just feel like Phil Foden you can't sacrifice De Bruyne and put Foden out wide again I just don't think it works as well I had this conversation uh, a, a lot on the Big Six, and I got absolutely crucified for it. Um, I said, I believe there is a world where, where Kevin De Bruyne holds bench for Phil Foden right now. Because it, how can you turn to Phil Foden and say, you've been absolutely magnificent, magnificent for six to eight months now, You know, running midfields, really stepping up to that level that we've wanted from Phil Foden for so long, and tell him, well, you're not playing because Kevin De Bruyne is coming. Would you, keep a, would you mm. keep a De Bruyne on the bench? see how it goes and then last 20 minutes when the game's fucking going long Real Madrid are a bit tired introduce a fresh Kevin De Bruyne off the bench just fucking pulling the strings I, I like that I like that but people view it as oh you're disrespecting Kevin De Bruyne no I think it's man I think it's game management I think hey we've got a title running to come we've got a big game at weekend at Chelsea in the semi-final at Wembley and we've got Real Madrid at home and I feel like we don't want to flog him because there's been seasons where we flogged him that much. Come to the end of the season, he was just basically on his ass. But I feel with game management, if we can trust Phil Foden to play in that middle, why not play Phil? He's younger, he's fresher. Why don't we keep our cards close to our chest on the bench? And then if we are finding it a bit struggle, you look at the bench, you've got Kevin De Bruyne to come up. You know what I mean? If we show Real Madrid our cards early doors and it's not going to plan, you look at the bench, you're thinking... You know, where do we change it? Jeremy Doku, maybe. But other than that, I don't know. I think it takes a brave man to drop him in a game like that. But I think Pep could do it. Well, Pep is a brave yeah. man. Um, I, I was going to ask you, Tone, yeah. is there a world where you play both? Two eights? Yeah. 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 Why not? I, I think what's key is that John Stones plays. If John Stones plays, he will then shift up a little bit, provide Rodri with a bit of support, which perhaps allows that. I think if Akanji plays at right back, it's difficult really because I think Bernardo, De Bruyne and Foden will play two in the middle, one on the right. And it really is a toss up really, really with all three of them. And they, remember, no matter how they're lined up, they will interchange. Yeah. So whatever it is, it's not a stationary thing. De Bruyne's always going out to the right hand side on the edge of the ball all the time. And Foden will go out there and it's it. If they line up that way, let's just say they go Bernardo right, De Bruyne Foden in the middle, they're all going to switch and swap over. And they can certainly do that. They're good enough. They're clever enough to do it. And I think we take the game to Real Madrid. We've got nothing to be frightened of. You never know on the day. Liverpool better than Palace, but they lost. But we're better than Real Madrid, in my view. We're the favourites to win the game. Yeah. Get in, take them on. Do your best 11 and... My view is my, our best eleven has De Bruyne in it because when he is playing well, he's the, in my view the best player not only in our team but the Premier League. He is unbelievable, and yeah, I, I would start him. This is not a game. I love Kovacic, but in my view, this is not a game for the safety net of Kovacic. Mm, mm. It's a difficult one, uh, but it's a, it's a good headache to have. I mean, Joe, mm. how do you feel about it with, with Foden being so good, but De Bruyne is obviously Kevin De Bruyne. Well, the dream is both, isn't it? But, I mean, I, I said a few weeks ago that I'd tie with the idea of De Bruyne on the bench for, you know, last 20, 30 minutes of games just as an impact sub because him against a tired defence. And again, 
I'm not sure. I mean, look, the last couple of games has been good, but there, there was a period just before the international break. It was sort of, we played United at home, Liverpool away, where those two starts weren't his greatest performances. Like he was a bit underwhelming in both of those games. And I just thought that he was still not ready to play a, like an intense 90 minutes on like a back-to-back basis at that point. So I, I, I've said a few weeks ago, I'd tie with still bringing him off the bench while he gets his legs back, but he's had two good performances, like Crystal Palace, Luton. How can you really say Real Madrid at home, you're not starting? We all saw what he did against Real Madrid um, last season in the big games, last season against Arsenal. Like, he is the ultimate big game player. So how can you say no? But then how can you, you tell Phil Foden, who's scored two hat-tricks, playing in the number 10 this season, that he's going to be forced out to do right wing shifts again. Like it's not, it's a good headache to have. The dream scenario is both. I really want to see both. We saw both against Brentford away. Foden scored a hat-trick. De Bruyne assisted him once. Like it works. It can work. And again, we're at home. We're at home. This is not going to the Bernabeu where I'd get it, not playing both of them in the middle. But we're at home. We should take the game to Madrid. We, you saw what happened last season when we took the game to Madrid. I know it's slightly different because the team this season is, you know, it, it's changed. It's not as good as it was last season, but we're still the home side. When was the last time we lost a home game? We lost a home game in the Champions League as well. The last the last game before the Qatar World Cup. Like, that, that, that's insane. Like, we have an unbelievable home record. We should be going for this. We should be going for this. this we're favourites. It's yeah. I mean, it's just so difficult, Steve. How have you found Phil Foden this season and the progression he's made? And is next season, do you reckon, the time where he he is the Kevin De Bruyne for us, the the, the first name of the team sheet? Yeah, I think did the overlap beginning of the season, and they they mentioned him. There's a clip out there where they said it's got to be a standout season. I feel like he was on the edges of the squad, in and out, dipping his toe in and out, doing special things, then disappearing for a bit. And I don't think he was one of the main names on the team sheet. Mm-hmm. Um, I probably don't, don't know City fan knew where his best position was. You know what I mean? Some preferred him wide, some preferred him in the middle, some wanted him as a false nine. And then this year when Kevin was out for six months, he's, he just took that, that, that middle as his own. And I feel like he looks better there. I feel like Pep trusts him now in that role. And he's now delivering on the biggest stage and scoring in the biggest games. You know what I mean? Man United, Atricks, uh, you know, Real Madrid, Bernabeu. And I feel like that's the Phil Foden that we, we, we've brought through the academy. He's never left on loan. He's always stayed around the club and, and, and we're benefiting it from it now. People forget how young he is, the trophies he's won, but I feel he's now um, a superstar uh, along the elite level like the Harlands and that he's a superstar and I feel like next season is his standout season where he can just make that position his own and uh, I think the job City's done with him around all the plays he's played with shadowing Kevin De Bruyne and things like that I think they've they've, they've, they've made him into a great player and like you say any academy prospect in this academy now looking for a, a clear path to, to the first team only has to look at Phil Foden where the press were telling us to send him out on loan and you're going to ruin him and he's going to be sat on the bench for five years. Look at him now. He's playing in the biggest, the biggest games. He's winning trebles. He's got more medals than anyone and, and, and he's a key part of the squad. So, yeah, Phil Bowden for me, next season's a big one. He's up there with some of the most successful English players of all time, medals-wise right now, at the age of 23. Uh, a good stat for Foden now is he now has more Premier League hat-tricks than Cristiano Ronaldo Didier Drogba and Frank Lampard at the age yeah. of 23. Man. The kids, he's reaping the rewards, I think, Foden, of being patient and trusting the progression plan made for him. We've seen so many players in recent years, Cole Palmer, Jaden Sancho, um, Lavia, who weren't willing to wait till the end of the, the progression plan that Pep makes them. You know, Pep obviously says to these players when they're brought into the first team, I see a pathway for you. Uh, and then they get a bit ahead of themselves, big, big for their boots, and they start going, no, I want to be a main player now. Foden never did that. He sat tight, worked hard. He's become a hybrid of so many great players that we've seen come and go. Um, but Tone, it's just fantastic to see him flourishing the way he is. And I said the other night on a show that I believe now, right now, Phil Foden is world-class. I believe he's one of the best footballers in the world. 
and people are just dismissing it. And I'm kind of going, well, why are you dismissing it? He's turned up in multiple Champions League games, derbies, big Premier League clashes, and then does it in the burnabout, pulls that goal out of his pocket. What does he have to do at this point to be a world-class footballer? I just think he doesn't get anywhere near enough praise. And if he was wearing the colour red, would he be getting that praise? Oh, I would should say. I mean, they're praising Sir Bosley, or however you pronounce it, in the earlier in the season as one of the best players in the league. He's been shy. So, oh, you can, Mike, you can put good money on that. I and mean, if he played in red, he would be one of the, he, he is world class. He, he's not star boy. He, he's the man. He's star man. He's already world class. He's not, he can get even better. I think, like Steve said, next season is a biggie or even bigger for him. He, he can play for any team in the world in any position. And I include Real Madrid in their star studded midfield and all the rest of them. He is as good as anybody in world football at the moment. He's certainly in that top band of players with the De Bruyne's and so on. He, he's amazing. He, he just, yeah. If you're starting for City week in week out, you've got to be pretty good. And he does. Obviously, he's not as good as Saka, so say Arsenal fans. But other than that, but I do wonder if it's a. Uh, because he's an England player. But we do get this with some England players where people are sometimes a bit wary with England players. If Foden was Brazil, Brazilian or Portuguese or something, Fodinho. sometimes people jump onto that and sort of go, oh, look at the flair and the skill of the goals. English, it's always a bit more, oh, I don't know, yeah, yeah, he's good, he's good, but he's, you know, in the back of your mind, he's England and they're crap. And I don't know, there's always something, I think, even with Harry Kane, he's top, top class Harry Kane, brilliant player, but there is still that thing of, yeah, but he's not that good, is he? You know, is that because he's English? I, I don't know. It's just a thing I've thought of before. Not sure what you lads think, if that's anything. Probably not. But... Joe? <clears throat> well, I mean, like, the amount of trophies he's won is insane. Um, he's, I think he's played the most minutes out of anyone this season. Like, yeah. he, he, he's just so important. Like, there's there's only two arguments in terms of our player this season, and that's one is Rodri, who hasn't lost a game of football in over a year, which is insane. And the other one is Phil Foden, who for the last few seasons hasn't had a position. Like if he was wearing red, we've had this discussion so many times. If he was wearing red, he'd be front runner for player of the season doing what he's doing right now. He'd be like unanimous. He'd be like he's the best player in the world, he's he's this, he's that, but because he doesn't play in red. It's sort of on the back burner. Some people will give him a little bit of credit every now and then when he's brought up, but they won't go out of their way to go, well, look how good he's playing. Like, whereas Saka, people go out of their way to go, look how many goals he's scoring. They don't take into account most of them are penalties. Phil Foden's on 22 goals this season. He hasn't scored a single... Like, he doesn't take penalties. He's not on penalties. He doesn't take them. Like, he's not padding his stats out. Those are, you know, raw goals. And how many of them are outside the box as well? Like, how many screamers has he scored? Like he's just good at pretty much everything on the pitch. Like he's he's up to his game. He works hard, which is why again I want to see him play with Kevin De Bruyne in the middle because we know that with De Bruyne he's not going to be able to run around for a long time because that's that's just given his age and his recent injury problems. He's not going to do the legwork. There is no doubt in my mind Phil Foden could do that legwork. Some of the things I've seen from him this season, he runs. He runs so much. He's out on his ass a lot of the time. Like He just works so hard and he's reaping the rewards. I think this is probably, just without even looking at the stats, this is his best return ever. Like He's been the main guy for a team that is still on for a treble. He's, he's had to somewhat... He's had to bear the responsibility of no Kevin De Bruyne, obviously, for large parts of the season. But people are, don't talk about the fact that he's also had to step in and help out where Gundogan may have helped out, you know, in, in those kind of things. He's had to stretch himself massively this season, Phil Foden. But, um, yeah, he, he's going to play in, in, against Madrid on Wednesday night. It's just we don't know <laughs> exactly where. Um, I'm kind of in between. I'm kind of in between. I don't think Pep knows where either. <sighs> I don't know. I don't know. I think I'm in between um, De Bruyne starting, but I also like the idea of De Bruyne on the bench because I look at Real Madrid's bench, they don't have a player like Kevin De Bruyne to come off the bench uh, and change the game. They have Brahim Diaz, they have I, I don't even know who else they have, but they don't have they had any Modric on the bench last time. Modric got four. Well, when he came on. He, 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 he thought, oh, it's only Modric, but 
who are allowing him to get on the ball and, and literally dictate the play. So, um, yeah, he's he's like, obviously, was there Kevin De Bruyne. Obviously, he's now coming off the bench and affecting games late on. But, yeah, I'm not worried about Madrid's bench, to be fair. No, no, no. no, but you, no. If, you, if you were in Madrid, you'd be worried about our bench or Kevin De Bruyne on it, wouldn't you? You'd be saying, shit, this guy yeah, can come home and steal it. You, you would be with Doku as well, because he's a game-changer. Alvarez, Alvarez, Doku, oh, yeah. and De Bruyne on the bench. It's not bad. Is it even Kovacic, who, OK, may not be the lightning change game, but still a bloody quality, experienced player. We yeah. The options we have are all over, even at the back. If, everyone, if we have a fully fit squad, yeah, the bench is going to be very, very tasty indeed. Mm, mm, absolutely. Uh, big up Rob for sending the super chat. No message attached, but big up for the support. Massively appreciate you. Jerry McCune says, Why do people keep doubting Pep? Shark team loading, business as usual. Dun 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 dun. Mm. Uh, Steve, you've really started a movement with this shark thing. Everywhere I go, yeah. I'm seeing sharks. And <laughs> oh, it's, it's it's me, it's, yeah, it was sort of driving me mad. I didn't want to do it this year, but I've been getting that much stick last night. I just had to put it back out there. There he is. I put on a big, great white shark. That was it. 8,000 likes I've got last night. That is how mad people Wow. People were waiting for the shark all year, man. Wow. <laughs> I think people enjoy the shark more than they enjoy actually winning the trophies at this point. It's just no fun. <laughs> Do you know how many T-shirts I've been sent with sharks on? Inflatable sharks, shark hats. Honestly, it's it. when we was going to win the league last year and I was in the south stand and someone brought me a shark, an inflatable shark. I was with you, mate. I was with you that with the minute yeah, it happened. Yeah, yeah, she gave me the shark. And then we was out it, in Madrid and we brought the giant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was funny, man. A bit of fun. It was a bit of fun, but uh, yeah, it was good. It, it would have been shit if it backfired on me. I would have been shark memes, baby shark videos, everything. So tell you what, mate, if you can if you can find a really classy looking terrace cult shark sort of t shirt, it'll do numbers. Do numbers. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I was at um for the Liverpool game uh, a couple of weeks ago. I was at a Manchester City supporters club here in Dublin, an event, and this guy comes up to me and he's wearing a he's wearing one of your um treble treble the Oasis kind oh, of yeah. treble looking thing, and he was uh, it was him or someone else said to me, oh then Terrace Colton need to make some sort of a shark t shirt like obviously not just slap a emoji of a shark yeah, yeah, yeah. even like a tiny little shark like logo there and Terrace it would it would do numbers man it'd be sick. People but, love um, the shark man. I can't believe it. Can't believe it. <laughs> It's unbelievable. Yeah, big up for the super chats, people. Uh, we've got about ten minutes left. I want to talk about one or two more things, then we'll wrap it up. Hit the like button. Two hundred people here. Subscribe if you're new uh, and check out the lads. The last player I want to touch in on is Erling Haaland. Um, a lot of talk about Erling Haaland. Roy Keane obviously stirring the pot, saying he's got the football quality that of a League Two player, and so on and so forth. Um, I mean, Steve, how have you found Haaland this season? I think he himself has been frustrated um, th through one reason or another, but he's he's still getting the numbers. His numbers, are st they're still outstanding. I think the word frustrating is is is, is exactly that. I feel like um, for us watching, it's frustrating. For him playing, it's frustrating. I feel like sometimes they don't play to his strengths. I feel like us as football fans, we, we want to see balls coming in the box, big Earl getting on the end of it. Follies, sliding in the back post, all that. But I feel like the way we play, obviously, sometimes it's not all about early. And, and he knows that now. And I feel like, you know, there's games where I genuinely believe that Pep's telling him to keep the centre-backs away from the midfield. So just wrestle, tussle, make dummy runs, get them all agitated, make sure you're always on your toes. And I think that allows the Phil Foden's and the Kevin De Bruyne's Bernardo's to come in into that midfield and hurt teams. I know it's not ideal and I know it's not what Erling Haaland probably thought, but A, he's chipping in with goals. He's still scoring. Look at the goals he scored. And B, he's done it with, with, with players all over his career. He took Thierry Henry to Barcelona, played him out wide after time. He didn't want him to touch the ball, wasn't allowed to shoot, wasn't allowed to cross. It's Thierry Henry. But it was part of the team. And, and, and I think that Erling's getting that now. I feel like he's matured a lot. And I feel like if you, it's so hard for Erling Haaland, the player, to watch because if you watch him and he knows, like City are recycling the ball left to right, left to right, and he's, nothing's coming in the box, but he's always got to be switched on because when that time comes, when it does, he's got to deliver. Uh, I feel like big players like Mbappe 
And that if Manchester City was to sign someone like that and ask him to do a sort of role like that, I don't think they want did want to do it. So he's had a good season. He's, he's the goals don't lie. I think he set the, the bar so high that anything below that, people that are going, oh, he's not doing well this season. But fucking hell, the numbers he hit last season were ridiculous. So what's he got now? Thirty odd goals or something? Still in the Premier League? So. Yeah, man. He's, I think he's got plenty more in the tank. And I feel like, you know, um, if we're going to win these trophies we're talking about, he's definitely going to have a big say in it. Yeah, I agree. Um, it's a funny role that he has to play, um, Erling Haaland. I was watching him against Real Madrid, obviously things you wouldn't see on camera just by being in the stadium. And the relationship he was forming, the battle he was forming with both Chumeni and Rudiger, it's so invaluable um, to our overall play. I mean, recently we're seeing Foden's, De Bruyne's, um, Grealish's, these kind of people chip in with goals and assists and being really creative in these pockets that are forming. Why? Because Haaland himself is occupying centre half so much that that these wide players and central players are getting uh, the room to do so. I, I mean, Tone, how have you found Haaland this season? Um, and I suppose that the the negative the negative connotations being put in his name, I find really. I find really unfair, um, but people are going to do it, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, the League 2 or League 1, whatever it was, that's, that's nonsense stuff, isn't it? That's just Roy Keane trying to get a headline. But I, I like, uh, I think he's been okay. I don't think he's been great. I think his movement's been fine. Some of the finishing, not as good as last season. Uh, his movement was really good the other day. He got criticised. I can't think who it was. We played now. Uh, Crikey, did we just play at lunchtime? Uh, Luton. Luton. Um, yeah, so it, I thought his move, I think his movements never changed. His movement's unbelievable when you watch him off the ball and moving. It's just like Steve said, he's not getting room. He takes two centre backs, sometimes even three players sort of jump in to help a little bit, which allows Foden and De Bruyne and all the others three. So in terms of his season, he's been okay, which is mad considering he's scored 30 goals. You know, oh, it's okay. But he's at such a high level and so much is expected of him um, that even a slight drop-off, he probably seems bigger than it is. But it wouldn't surprise me if he if he puts in two or three on Wednesday, arms up and says, there you go, that's what I'm about. And then he'll bang in a couple more uh, in the FA Cup with Chelsea. He's a top, 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 top player. I know he's had problems with his, is it his foot or his ankle, something like that. So maybe maybe that's having a little effect. But he's still had a good season. But it's just so much. People just think, oh, 50 goals. If we're doing it 50 goals. 50 bloody goals. Yeah, he's, he's still top class. And he starts every single key match. And that's the key thing is there, is he, he in my view, starts every every game between now and the end, no matter what. what. See, what he did last season, I think Steve hit the nail on the head, it was abnormal. Everything about last mm. season, the trophies won, the performances, the, the, the lack of goals conceded in the second half of the season, uh, and the most he scored, and the amount he scored, it's abnormal. It's a total anomaly, what, what happened last season. So to hold him to those standards, it's it's totally unfair on him. You know what I mean? To expect, was it, 52 goals in all comps last season? You, you, can't, you can't say he's poor if he's not hitting 52. Um, so I do feel from him in that sense. Um, but Joe, how, how, how do you feel about Haaland um, and the whole situation and the role he's playing? I mean, again, this is another conversation that we keep on having recently. I don't know how you resolve the the frustrations that he's having. Apart from just you just got to tell him that he's got to get on with it like that. That's what's happening. the 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 game plan, the blueprint that everybody is using, whenever they come to the Etihad, is sit back, soak up pressure, stick two three men on Haaland, sit with a back five, sometimes even a back six if your name's Arsenal and Mikel Arteta, and just try and not get just try and not get slapped. Just try and not lose, and. It was the same thing even when we went to the Bernabeu. He had Rudiger and Chumeni on him at all times, literally stood on him, head up, like over his shoulders, practically hugging him. Like Phil Foden scores from the edge of the box because there's no one there to block the shot because the centre half is so preoccupied with Haaland. They stood on him. There's no one in the way of Foden. So he puts in the top corner. Like he's still providing the team with something useful, even if he's not even touching the ball. 
he still provides the team with something, even if it is just a physical presence. That's something that is invaluable. You don't get many players who can score at the rate he does that can affect the game without even having to touch the ball. Like how, how many players in world football can change a game without even being remotely close to where the ball is? Alan can do that. He just takes up such a presence that teams are scared of him. They're so scared that they game plan for him and they'd rather someone else wins the game instead of him. That, that's the that's where we're at. They would rather that Phil Foden scores a worldie or Kevin De Bruyne scores a worldie than Erling Haaland gets service. That, that, that's the game plan from teams at the moment. It's another um, it's another example that people don't talk about a lot of how Pep's changed things up. He's constantly changing the way City approach games and making us less predictable, whereas last season it was quite clear that we were so focused on getting the ball to Haaland and getting the ball in the back of the net that this season naturally teams would be like, right, that's City's game plan. This is what they're going to do. They're going to try and hit Haaland, so let's congest Haaland. So Pep's gone right. We're not. We're just going to use Haaland as nearly a decoy, like the way you speak about Thierry Henry at, at Barcelona, and we're going to see these wide players and, and midfielders flourish. So it's Pep Guardiola. It's Pep Guardiola's tactics, and as you say, Haaland may not like them, but uh, if it wins us trophies, he says it himself he doesn't care if he doesn't score goals as long as he gets the trophies, uh, and that's what we want. So. Hopefully, hopefully he can do the job for us against Real Madrid on Wednesday night, but we've got more than enough players that can. Um, before we wrap it up, I want to get a couple of predictions uh, for Wednesday night, and I suppose now that we're in the driving seat for the Premier League, Steve, how you feel and how you see it sort of panning out. Are you confident that now we are in that driving seat, we'll get the bit between our teeth and, and do the job? Listen, it's in our hands, so we've just got to take control I feel like we've just got to take every game at a time. I don't think we're daft enough to say we've won it now. We've seen plenty of twists and turns. So Pep and the boys will be uh, buzzing this morning with the results that have gone for them. And I think they'll now be thinking, right, we, we can do it. Um, so I'm not really going to comment on the league. Just keep one game at a time. But Real Madrid on Wednesday, I feel like um, we're going to get the job done. I feel like it's going to be another... Big, big game at the Etihad under the lights and uh, we'll make history go to the semi-final. I think we'll win 3-1. 3-1. Tone, would you reckon, mate? Uh, in terms of the league, I'd make us marginal favourites, but yeah, I don't don't want to. Yeah. Um, Wednesday, yeah, I, I like 3-1. I was thinking 2-0, but I might pinch one. But yeah, I think 3-1 and I think I don't want to put a curse on it or anything but I, I think well, we're not comfortably but I think we'll have another dominant display maybe not the level of last year which the first half especially is one of the best halves I've ever seen from any team so I'm trying not to go into it thinking we'll do that but I still think we'll be dominant and I think we'll turn up crowd will be unbelievable everyone supporting I, I just I just fancy it I really do really really fancy it 3-1 sorry Steve copied you mate but 3-1 <laughs> Three one, three one. We'll take it. Myself and Joe will do a full preview stream tomorrow afternoon, tomorrow evening. We'll, we'll do predicted eleven and our own predictions, that sort of thing. So make sure you're subscribed and notification bell on if you want to see that. I think we'll wrap it up there. It's been a fantastic show, chatting title race, chatting Champions League, talking about certain players. Um, our first time getting guests on the channel since myself and Joe decided to go full time here. So massively, massively appreciate uh, both Big Steve and Tone for joining us. Make sure you check out at Big Steve MCFC on YouTube and across all socials at MCFC Tone. Always active on Twitter, giving pieces of news, giving opinions. Um, always great to read and that sort of thing. But listen, chat, massively appreciate everybody who tuned in. Like I said, myself and Joe will be live tomorrow. I've got Big Six tonight, so there probably won't be any uh, more streams here, but definitely tomorrow. And then we're going to do a watch along. I'm not, I gave away my ticket for the Real Madrid game on Wednesday um to someone i think deserved it so we're going to do a watch long for the first time uh, in years on this channel so i'm looking forward to that so make sure you're subscribed lots of great content to come hopefully we can get steve and tone on again in the near future once again massively appreciate their time hit the like button on your way out leave your comments in uh, if you're watching on playback down below i read through all of them and we'll see you all very soon have a good rest of your day in a bit <laughs>